Uh, we, you know, something interesting has happened with our debt here recently that hasn't happened in, in, in history, really. Uh, we got to about $26 trillion by borrowing money. And then, most recently, when COVID hit, and the first $2 trillion package came to the floor, uh, there weren't $2 trillion to borrow. It didn't exist uh, in circulation. So what, what happened? How did we finance that debt? How did we finance that $2 trillion and the next $2 trillion and the next trillion? In fact, we financed $5 trillion of this debt by printing money. The Federal Reserve printed the money, and then the Treasury borrowed it from the Federal Reserve. So we kind of borrowed it from ourselves, but what came into existence was $5 trillion that did not exist before. Now, had we borrowed it, we would have taken it out of the economy, and then when the money was put back into the economy through various programs that were supposed to help businesses but, and may or may not have had their intended effect, uh, if, we had done, if we had borrowed the money and put the money back in, we wouldn't have increased the money in circulation. But what we did over the last three years is increase five, by $5 trillion the amount of money that's in circulation before the banks loaned it out fractionally. Mr. Raskin, do you think that uh, creating new money and putting it into the economy had any effect on inflation? But I assume it does, but I've not looked at the studies about that. I mean, you're talking about the QE2 lending program that the Fed set up with Treasury? This is since uh, QE2. Yeah. This was f specifically for COVID. We, uh, the Federal Reserve created $5 trillion. If you look at their graph, it's kind of flat for uh, since 1917, yeah. their balance sheet. Then it went up $5 trillion right there. at the. Uh, and so what that means is, Five trillion dollars came from somewhere. What what happened is they printed the money and then loaned it to Treasury. Then Treasury, well, we spent the money. I don't want to blame Treasury. Congress appropriated this money and it went out the door. And then that went into people's hands and they started buying stuff. Right. No, I mean that's a serious question. And um, certainly there are there are fiscal stimulus sources of inflation, and there are, um, you know, and there are. Fed uh, sources of inflation as well. But they're not executive order sources of inflation. I mean, no economists have ever identified that. So, but, but that's a serious question. And of course, Chip, uh, that goes, I, tea? I mean, that, that goes way beyond the, the purview of this legislation. So the, this is Chip Roy's tea. He doesn't need it anymore, I've decided. <laughs> this is what happens when you have a quantity of something and then you add more to it. This is dilution. The, the principle is so simple that a child can understand. And you can create this little science project at home. Sorry, you can have your tea back. Okay. But the principle is called dilution. And when you print $5 trillion and you put it into the economy, you have diluted the value of the money. So for instance, if you had a minimum wage, at, at some amount, and somebody was making minimum wage, and they were still making minimum wage after this money was printed, they actually are, are making considerably less in terms of real dollars. It's dilution. So uh, the $5 trillion that we printed, I would uh, argue, is the primary source of inflation. You know, we can, we can say, well, eggs went up because feed went up, Fuel went up because uh, there's a war in Ukraine. You can, you can find a lot of excuses for various different industries. But what is the probability that every price went up all at the same time? You can't blame them on specific supply chain problems. The, the thing how, do you, that, how do you explain the global? Industry? Yes, I'm glad you asked me that, Professor Raskin. Yeah. Because they did the same thing in Europe. They, they did this everywhere. They printed their own equivalents of the Federal Reserve and Treasuries created their own money out of thin air. Mm -hmm. It may be the only thing that saved our dollar is that everybody else did the same thing to their currency. Is they, uh, it's, and so, the, you know, the question is, right now we're coming up on the debt limit. Why, why isn't anybody proposing to print more money? 
Why aren't the economists proposing to print more money? Because it is poison. When you print money, it is poison to our economy, and it, it is very regressive. Inflation is extremely regressive, especially when it affects the, the, the goods that everybody needs to buy, energy. I love it when they print the consumer price index, neglecting food and energy and housing, right? Like the three things that no matter how poor you are, you still need. We'll just leave those out when, when we look at the, at the effect of inflation, but you can't leave those things out. So um, the reason we're not, you know, we could, just, we could just print more money again like we did over the last three years, but the reality is everybody in this room knows, and if we don't, we have staff who know, that if you print money, you're going to wreck this economy. So uh, I found it interesting that the Fed raised interest rates very aggressively over the, the last several quarters, the last year. Do you have any idea, Mr. Raskin, why they would raise interest rates? You know, but I, I really don't. I've not followed it that closely. I mean, your line of questioning to me is interesting because I think it goes to what the real sources of inflation are in the economy and what the money supply is and so on. Remember that the various actions taken that you identified were in response to a crisis, which was COVID-19 and an economic collapse in the country. And everybody on a bipartisan basis, with perhaps the potential exception of you, was demanding that the federal, is, yeah. the federal government act in order to bolster the economy because the restaurants were going down and the hotels were going down and our businesses were collapsing. And so, um, we, you know, we make no apologies for any of the rescue legislation that we did, and we think we did the right thing, even if that was, you know, some small contributor to the overall global inflation uh, that we saw. And I will say that, of course, this has been a bipartisan um, policy commitment and under President Trump. We know that uh, your side of the aisle voted three times to lift the, def the debt limit uh, as requested by President Trump. And President Trump's own spending contributed 25% of the total debt of the United States from George Washington to Joe Biden, 25% of it. So this is a, a bipartisan problem that we got to deal with. I, I like those numbers where we look at which administration was in power when the debt went up and how, what percent, you know, maybe 25% under Trump. Um, reality is we are the ones who raised the debt limit, not, not the uh, president. So I went back and looked at, to see which, under which speaker did the debt limit go or did the debt go up the most. And it turns out somewhere between uh, 43 and 45 percent of all the debt, you mentioned that 25 percent of all the debt was under Trump. Using those same metrics, 43 to 45 percent of all the debt ever incurred in this country happened while uh, Ms. Pelosi was speaker. Now, she had a good run at it. She had two chances to do it. She was speaker twice. But, uh, you know, so I think it's unfair to blame any one administration. I think it's more fair to blame us. And in reality, uh, because we're the ones who raised it. Now, the problem with the stimulus that we did during COVID, yes, there was an economic calamity and people stayed home. But when you gave farmers money, when you gave people money, the farmers didn't make more goods. The factories didn't make more goods. The refineries didn't refine more oil. Uh, demand for fuel went down, so we saw a temporary, if you look at inflation, it actually went down there for a while while nobody was doing much of anything. But after we put that money in their hands, now they're chasing goods that don't exist. We, they literally buying the inventory because so many things were shut down. Let me ask you, Mr. Comer, the, the same question I asked Mr. Raskin about uh, interest rates and, and why the Federal Reserve might raise might have raised the interest rates so aggressively. Do you, do you have any idea of what they might have been trying to do when they raised those interest rates? They're trying to slow inflation. You raise yeah. interest rates for, for one reason, and that's to slow inflation. Yep. So the, uh, the two ways that most economists would agree you reduce inflation is you raise interest rates and you reduce government spending. So, uh, and that's ex exactly what they did. Now, I found it interesting that now that we have established that, and we all know that they raised, nobody would want to raise interest right. rates. You, in, low interest rates, people can borrow money, you can buy housing, the price of housing, you know, people can afford housing more. Uh, 
uh, investors, entrepreneurs can get money more easily, and your economy grows faster with lower interest rates. So they would prefer to have them low, but they had to raise them, they felt, to combat inflation. Now, what, what I found interesting was the timing. Mr. Raskin, why do you think they really aggressively raised interest rates just a, a week or two after the Inflation Reduction Act passed? I mean, the Federal Reserve raised interest. I thought it was kind of interesting uh, that they would do it since we already had an, an Inflation Reduction Act and it had been signed by the president. Why would they take acts? action to do that. Well, I take it everybody was calling for action on inflation, so it required a kind of coordinated response, and the Fed acting in the same direction as Congress makes sense. It may be, I mean, maybe uh, Senator Joe Manchin reduced the confidence at the Federal Reserve that the, uh, that the Inflation Reduction Act was going to do much of anything when he said it wouldn't do much of anything. Uh, and I think that's what we all know. It was a, it was a, a climate change bill, and it wasn't really about reducing inflation. Uh, well, if I could say one thing on that. Yes, it, please. It certainly re reduced the cost of prescription drugs for people in the Medicare program and re just reduced the cost of uh, diabetics getting their insulin shots. So that affects millions and millions of our constituents across the country. That was so, inflation, too. So, so we, here's, here's the interesting thing. The arsonists became the firefighters at the Federal Reserve. If you remember where I began, $5 trillion was created by the Federal Reserve. And then, uh, which we said, thank you very much, we'll take those $5 trillion new imaginary dollars that's been just like real dollars, and we'll, uh, actually we didn't put a lot of that money into the hands of consumers. They got maybe 12% of it, 20% if you count the unemployment programs. Most of it went to big companies. But, uh, so then we, we took the $5 trillion the Federal Reserve created and caused massive inflation with the Federal Reserve printing that money. Now who's here to save the day? The Federal Reserve comes in on a, on a white horse. Oh, look at this fire, this raging fire called inflation. We're going to put it out. We've got just the tool. We're, we're going to hose down the economy. This thing is too hot. Well, the reality is it wasn't too hot. Inflation was too hot. Sometimes you raise interest rates when, you know, if your economy is doing great, it's, it can be a tool, a reasonable tool, to reduce inflation. The problem is when your inflation's raging and your economy is not and you raise interest rates, you just make life difficult on everybody, on people trying to buy homes, on, on businesses who are trying to invest and expand production to meet the new demand of the new money that's out there. Um, so anyways, I just hope everybody recognizes that the uh, the firefighters, i.e. the Fed, are the arsonists who started this problem by creating $5 trillion out of, of thin air. And, and here's, here's what else is going to happen. We haven't even begun to see inflation, like what the result of all that will be. That's why I think this bill is important. We shouldn't be doing things that exacerbate this track that we are already on. Mark, mark my words, I know a lot of people don't come to Rules Committee to look for predictions. But I'm, I'm going to make a prediction. This is the tip of the iceberg, the inflation that we are see, seeing, because we, we have to refinance that $32 trillion of debt that we have right now. And, um, you know, the interest rates, the Fed raised the interest rates about 2.5%. Uh, so now, some of the debt we have at 30, the $32 trillion, we have short-term debt. And it'll have to be refinanced quickly. Some of it already has been refinanced at these higher rates. Some of it's much longer, 10 years. But um, if you refinanced $32 trillion at 2.5% higher interest rates, that's $800 billion of additional interest. Here's, here's what makes me so concerned. How are we going to finance the additional $800 billion of interest? Are we going to raise taxes? I don't think we are. I, th I think we're the going... The gentleman, you? In just a second. I think we're going to print more money. And what's that going to do? It's going to raise inflation. And what will the Fed do to try to control inflation? They will raise interest rates. What's going to happen then? We're going to have higher uh, interest on our own debt. We're going to print more money. I think we're at the beginning of a vicious cycle that's not going to calm down for a while. And I'll yield to Mr. Nagoose. Yeah, I would just simply say I think you see a lot of... Heads nodding. I think it's a fascinating discussion, and I, I've certainly learned a lot. And I guess I wonder, 
why we can't take up a bill regarding the Fed's decision-making as opposed to this reporting bill about executive orders that has well, nothing to do with any of what you Thank you. I, will, I have a few of those bills, and I would love your – I have some Democrats in this bill, actually. Would love your co-sponsorship on an audit of the Federal Reserve. Let's vote this b bill down. And let's get back down to doing, you know, considering some of these other measures that might have a real impact. All right. I, think, I yield back. Thank you. I, 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 I'm reclaiming my time. I thank you very much. Uh, I, I just, I think this, this is a good bill. The, the only uh, concern that I have about it, and this, this gets to, the base bill itself has some exemptions or if there's an emergency or national security, it's got exemptions. Well, oh, let's don't, let's don't consider how much uh, uh, inflation we might be causing in our response to this emergency or to this national security issue. I think we, we shouldn't care what the reason is we're spending the money. We should always know what the, uh, what the consequences are to inflation. So I have, a, I have just a small issue with the base bill. But it's also an issue I have with most of the Democrat amendments to this bill. They create exemptions where you won't even want to measure what the, in, the uh, inflation is that's caused by it. So I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, my colleague, Mr. Roy, probably has an, I think he has an amendment to, to get rid of uh, all of the exemptions for when you wouldn't want to know when you're causing inflation. So uh, before I yield back, uh, I just want to say that I support Mr. Roy's amendment, and eggs are up 70 percent, butter's up 32 percent, airline fares are up 25 percent, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady from New Mexico, 